Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. It was good to see some of you yesterday at uh, the trick-or-treat that we had at Washington Parks. We were part of the district handing out candy to kids, and we were supposed to be there from like 10 to 1, and we ran out of candy before 1 o'clock, which is a good problem to have as long as you just get out quickly. When you run out of candy, don't let the kids know that you're out of candy. Just say, oh, it's, this was our time to go. So we, we got out of there before the kids revolted against us. But we had a great time. We saw, uh, I don't know how many people. It was in the hundreds, and we gave out a lot of flyers advertising for our family fun night coming up. So hopefully we'll see some new faces that will join us for that. But overall, it was just a great day. It was fun to be with several of you that were there, and uh, it was cool to see some of the costumes that the kids had, some of them were a little scary, but my kids reminded me that they're just costumes, Dad, it's okay. And they were, they were there when I, when I was scared and they helped me out and uh, it was, no, it was a good time and uh, just a reminder that it is fall and for me this last Sunday in October is kind of a, a cool day because, uh, not just because of the weather, but um, Maybe you remember this, maybe you don't, but I remember that the last Sunday in October of last year was my first time up here as my candidate sermon. So uh, I didn't start immediately, but it's been a year since the first time that I was here, and you haven't chased me out yet, so I appreciate that. But I didn't intend for you to clap, but I kind of liked it, so thanks. <laughs> no, it's, it's been uh, good to be here. It's been good to go through this series together. This is our last week in our series, Don't Fall. And if you remember that this series is a list of things that we should remember. The first thing that we talked about was to remember what's happened, and we used the example of the Israelites, and it was before they were preparing to enter into the promised land, and it was just a reminder for them from Deuteronomy of all the things that God had done for them. And the second week, when Dan Teefee was here with us, it was similar to the first week, and remember what's happened, also remember where you've come from. And for that, it was the Israelites remembering what God had removed them from as they had left Egypt, and they were preparing to enter into the promised land. And Last week, we talked about remember what you have, and maybe if you were here, you remember that there was difficulty for me in saying a certain word that I'm not going to attempt to say again this week, but I heard from a lot of you, so I think that's something that we will remember for a while, but the idea of remember what you have is just keeping in mind that benefits package, those things that God gives us, and the way that God hears our prayers the way that God restores us and heals us and gives us satisfaction. Not satisfaction, satisfaction. And I hope as we've gone through this, that this series has maybe been a little bit of a nudge in the ribs. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, just think of those times when you've been sitting next to someone and you've heard something said and they gave you that little elbow in the ribs. Maybe you're not familiar with that, but I certainly am for reasons. But this idea of the nudge in the ribs is that idea. It's a, a gentle reminder to pay attention, to be alert. And this series has been that for me as I've been preparing each week, just that little nudge from the Holy Spirit of, hey, like, you need to work on this yourself, buddy. Like, you don't just get to go up there and tell people what to do. You need to do this yourself. And that nudge has been there. I, I hope that it's been there for you as well. And that brings us to our last thing to remember for this series, and that is to remember what it's for. Because it's all well and good to remember what you have and where you've come from and what's happened, but we also need to remember what it's for. And ultimately, what it's all for, what God has done for us through giving us his son, Jesus Christ. We can sum that up in the last thing that Jesus said here on earth from Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And this is Jesus before he ascended back to heaven. He was with the disciples. 
they were gathered together and Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So we see here in what we call the Great Commission, that is ultimately what it's all for. And we could stop here, and this would be a very short sermon, but it would be a very important sermon because it's a reminder of what this is all for. That yes, we have God who loves us, God who has sent his son for us, but the purpose of that is one, to redeem us, to save us from sin, but then in turn, because of that, it becomes our job to share that good news, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's something that you will hear me say time and time again. If you do not hear me say that time and time again, come yell at me because I'm not doing my job. The whole point of us coming together is to be reminded of the good news of the gospel and also to be reminded of our need to share that good news, to go from here to take that message of the gospel to the world around us. This morning what we're going to do is we're going to look at the church at Ephesus and we're going to see how they were doing a good job in a lot of things, but there were times where they got off track. Sometimes they were doing good things rather than doing the most important thing. But before we do that, would you pray with me this morning? Lord God, again, we thank you for this time to come together. We thank you that we're able to be here, that we can sing praises to you, and we can open your word together, and we can worship together as a church family. Lord, I pray that as we open the word together, that we would have those gentle nudges and those reminders of what all of this is for. Now we would go from this place with a renewed sense of energy and a renewed sense of purpose and a renewed passion for sharing your good news with the world around us. Lord, we love you and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we're going to have two different looks at the church in Ephesus this morning. One is going to be kind of maybe the end of the story, or at least down the road a little ways, and then we're going to backtrack and we're going to look at how things started. So in Revelation 2, verses 2 through 5, if you remember, Revelation is when John was in isolation, when he was put on the Isle of Patmos to keep him from spreading the gospel, but while he was still there, he was writing letters to the churches, and he was telling them about things that God was showing him, and he was also giving them instructions. And this is part of what John was writing that had been revealed to him about the church at Ephesus. And it says this, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. When we read... These four verses, it's almost like there's two entirely different things happening because when we see the, the beginning of this passage, there's a lot that the church is doing right. He's complimenting them on their hard work and on their perseverance. These are things to be respected and to be admired. He says that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you don't put up with wicked people, and you have tested those who claim to be apostles, so people that are coming and saying that they have a message from God, you have tested those against scripture and about what you know about Jesus and you have found them to not be true. You have persevered and you have endured hardships and you have not grown weary. And they're doing a lot right, but as we finish that passage, it seems that the church at Ephesus is missing the main point. It says, you have forsaken the love that you had at first. And this love that is referenced here is the love for Jesus Christ. And this is ultimately what has bound the church together at Ephesus. And 
While we look at the church and we see the things that they are doing right, we also see that they are missing the main point. And a question I have for us this morning is, is it possible that this is true for us as followers of Jesus Christ? Yes, we get a lot of things right. If you were to look at our lives from the outside, you would say that we are people who do X, Y, and Z correct, but have we forgotten the love that we had at first? Have we forgotten that love that God has called us, that love that God has shown us, and that love that God then wants us to show and to reflect to others? So we get a lot right, but are we missing the main point? We rewind a little bit and we look at the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. Paul says this as he's writing to the church. He says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore remember that formerly you were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I don't know if you came here this morning expecting to hear about circumcision, but we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about that. But essentially what's happening is in Ephesus there were Jews and there were Gentiles. And previously, before Jesus, the Jewish people were the chosen people of God, that this was symbolized by circumcision as a sign of the covenant. And now after Jesus, Jews and Gentiles are worshiping Christ together, but there's still division because some are saying that you need to be circumcised in order to be a Christian, and the Gentiles are like, no thank you. And because of this, there is some strife and there is some division, but What Paul is saying is now you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Ultimately, all these other things don't matter. What matters is Jesus and what Jesus has done. And if we think back to that list of things in Revelation that the church was doing, it seems like they had lost track of the purpose for what they were doing. The church at Ephesus had forgotten that love that brought them together at first. They had lost sight of what had united them in Jesus Christ. And they were still doing good things. They were still living what from the outside would look like what we would consider a Christian life. But as for us in the same way, we go through this life and we can do things that are good. We can do things that are moral, that things that are appropriate. But if we leave Jesus out of the equation, We are missing the point. It's like running the vacuum over the floor without plugging it in. From the outside, if your neighbors see you through the window and you're vacuuming the floor, they think, well, they must be keeping a pretty clean house. But if that vacuum isn't plugged in, you're just wasting your time. And in the same way, if we're doing these things, but Jesus isn't at the center of it, we're wasting our time. If we're living a moral life, but it's not centered around Jesus, Ultimately, it doesn't matter. We need to keep sight. We need to keep Jesus at the middle and at the center of what we do. 1 John chapter 4 describes this. It describes what it looks like to keep Jesus at the center of your life. And perhaps this is a passage that you're familiar with. Uh, This is a passage that I've heard several times throughout the years. Sometimes it's a passage that's read at weddings, and simply it says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God has loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. 
As we go through this life, it's not about simply doing the right thing, but it's about doing what God has called us to. Because God has loved us, so then we ought to love. God loves us so that we love others. And frankly, that's something that's easy to say, and it's easy to remember, at least easy to remember to say it. But as I look at my own life, and perhaps as you look at your own life, you'll have that question of, what's keeping me from doing this? What is keeping us from sharing God's love? I'll be honest, there are times when I'm thinking I do a good job. And then there are times, at the end of the day, where I'll just spare you what I say to myself. It's not very kind, but I know I mess things up. And sometimes I'll have that nudge that reminds me of, no, I'm supposed to be showing God's love. And what I did wasn't very loving. So maybe as we wrap things up this morning, as we move into what can we, how can we change, how can we live differently, we can talk about what is keeping us from sharing God's love. And the first thing I think that keeps us from sharing God's love is a lack of confidence. And if you're not sure what I mean by a lack of confidence, then congratulations on being a confident person. I'd love to know what that's like sometime. But this lack of confidence, maybe it's better put this way. It's that little two-word question in the back of your head of what if. The idea of what if frequently comes to mind is, well, what if this happens? Or what if this goes wrong? And what if I try to show God's love to someone and they respond this way? And sometimes this lack of confidence keeps us from doing what God has called us to because we're afraid of those what ifs because we don't know what's going to happen. Or perhaps instead of what if, it's I'm not sure. And I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm not sure what they're going to say. I'm not sure how they're going to react. And this, these questions, these doubts, these things keep us from sharing God's love. So we have a lack of confidence. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6 tells us this. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. So yes, there are times where we have a lack of confidence. That's when we need to turn to God. That we need to ask him for the strength. We need to ask him for that confidence, because our confidence comes from him. So this question of what is keeping us from sharing God's love, it's a, sometimes it's a lack of confidence, and frankly, a lot of times that lack of confidence leads to something a little bit deeper, and that is fear. And the lack of confidence asks us, what if? And those questions of what if lead to fear of well, what if that actually did happen? And then what would happen after that? And if I tell somebody about God's love for them, how are they going to respond? Are they going to look at me different and become afraid of how things might change? And sometimes when we have fear, it can be something that keeps us from action. Fear can be paralyzing. It can be something that keeps us stuck in one place. I see this frequently with my kids when there's something that they're afraid of and a lot of times their response is to freeze. And I'll grab their hand and I'll try to gently guide them and they're just stuck. If you've ever been in that position with a child before, you know that despite the relatively small stature, if a kid doesn't want to move, it's very difficult to get them to move. And sometimes we are like that in our lives, where the fear that we have, the fear of the unknown, keeps us from moving. Sometimes when I'm afraid, I'll ask myself another question. Instead of what if, I'll ask myself, what's the worst that could happen? 
And I'll just kind of let that play out and I'll come up with these crazy scenarios of the worst possible thing that could happen. And then I'll ask myself another question. Well, what, what are the chances of that actually happening? And sometimes by thinking of the worst possible thing that could happen, I actually start to realize that my fears aren't all that realistic and I don't have as much to be afraid of. And even if I did have something to be afraid of, it might not be as bad as I'm making it out to be in my mind. First Peter 3, 13 and 14 says this, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. So we ask ourselves, what's the worst that could happen the chances are that's probably not actually going to happen. But even if it does, if we are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, if we are sharing God's love for others, First Peter tells us that even if we suffer for doing what is right, we are blessed. And that'll bring us to the third thing that might keep us from sharing God's love. And after a lack of confidence that might turn into fear, then we get to the third thing, which is apathy. And frankly, I think that this is far worse than the first two points. So you get to the point of apathy, it's not, oh, I'm not sure if I can do it, or I'm afraid, it's, I just don't really care. When you get to that point of not caring, that's a tough place to come back from. When I was a young person, I, I had someone once tell me that being apathetic is a pathetic way to be. And frankly, at the time, I didn't quite catch on that there was a little bit of wordplay there. I was like, well, that's kind of mean. But honestly, when you get to the point of apathy, it's this idea that I don't really care what happens. It's not a big deal. And, Sometimes as we go through our lives, unfortunately, I can feel myself taking this approach. I'm like, well, it doesn't really affect me. It's not that big of a deal. I'll just take care of myself and they can do whatever they want. And as we go through this life, yes, we have freedom and we each have the ability to make our individual choices and decisions, but that doesn't mean that we just stand idly by and we let people make terrible decisions, that we let people go through this life without trying to help, without offering a hand, without offering them the good news of Jesus Christ. If you see someone going in the wrong direction, if you see someone that's headed for a mess or headed for a crash, someone that's headed for destruction, you should be able to to try to stop, say stop, to try to reach out, and try to say there's a better way. James 4, 17 tells us that if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And this idea of apathy, if we're sitting by and we recognize that someone is going on the wrong path, that they are not following after what they should be doing, James tells us that is sin for us to sit idly by and not try to stop that. For me, that's a, a sobering thought. That's something that maybe is a little bit stronger than that nudge that I keep talking about. We need to guard ourselves against apathy, against this idea that we can just sit by, we can take care of ourselves and not worry about those around us. And that'll bring us to our fourth thing that keeps us from sharing God's love. Our fourth point this morning, and that is distraction. I don't know how all of you are with distraction, but I am from time to time a person that is easily distracted. If you ever step foot in my office, you might be able to determine that pretty quickly because I tend to have several books out that I'm reading at one time and I'll have things that I've started and not finished. And at my house, 
if you're ever there when we're, we're cleaning, you would definitely notice this because we have something that have been affectionately dubbed as Jesse tasks. And what this means is that we are cleaning the house, we're getting ready for guests to come, and I decide that this is the perfect time for the ceiling fan blades in the basement. It's, that's the time I should clean them. We're cleaning the house and the, the fan blades are dirty. Our guests are coming over. They're not going in the basement, but I notice the dirt at this point and I need to get that done. Or maybe this is the time that I decide that I really need to pull up those weeds in the backyard. Even though we're having someone over for dinner in our house, those weeds in the backyard, that's the time to take care of them. We call these Jesse tasks because while I'm doing something, something is becoming accomplished, it is not actually helping with the goal at the moment. And being distracted is something that I think all of us are affected by. And being distracted in tasks is one thing, but being distracted from what God has called us to is something else entirely. There's this book by C.S. Lewis called The Screw Tape Letters. And in this book, C.S. Lewis is describing what one like senior level demon or devil is like giving instructions to a beginner on the job. Basically, it's like one of the demons is sharing instructions to a new guy on how to keep people away from what they're supposed to do, how to keep them from following after God, how to distract a person from following God, from following Jesus, and instead to lead them astray. And in this book, as Screwtape is writing to Wormwood, it says this, you will find that anything or nothing is sufficient to attract his wandering attention. You no longer need a good book, which he really likes, to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep. A column of advertisements in yesterday's paper will do. You can make him waste his time not only in conversation he enjoys with people whom he likes, but in conversations with those he cares nothing about on subjects that bore him. You can make him do nothing at all for long periods. And in this little excerpt, what we have described is frankly what I see happening in my own life quite often. I'm distracted by things that ultimately don't matter. And the thing about it is C.S. Lewis wrote this before there were smartphones. He wrote this before there was cable TV. He wrote this before there were 24-hour news channels and before we felt like we were constantly bombarded with news and, and all kinds of information. So the, with all of that, I, f- I feel like it's only getting harder and harder to avoid this distraction. But what C.S. Lewis has described and what he's tapped into here is something that's very real for us. It's that we're often people that are distracted from what God has called us to. And sometimes those things are well and good, they're good things that we should be doing, but far too often I'm distracted by things that don't really matter. I'll drive by a building multiple times as they're doing construction just to see how far it's going along. Instead of going home and being at home on time, I'll get sidetracked by little things that don't matter. Instead of sitting down and and checking on a friend that I know is going through a hard time, instead I'll scroll through their social media profile and see where the last place they went on vacation to is. Ultimately, what it boils down to is that we are a people that are easily distracted. We are a people that have lost sight of, of God and what he is calling us to, and we have replaced God's love at the center of our lives with all these things that ultimately provide us no satisfaction, that provide us nothing of substance, that are ultimately just time wasters. In Ephesians 5 Verses 15 and 16, it says, Be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. 
because the days are evil. And what this tells us is to be careful to measure each day, to measure each thing that we do in the day. Is this beneficial or is this distraction? Is this something that is edifying or is this something that is angering? Is this something that's going to build me up and build up others or is this something that's going to cause my blood to boil for no reason? Is this something that's going to make me closer to God? Is this something that's going to help me share the love of Christ with others? Or is this something that's just going to simply distract me until it's time to go to bed and start this all over again? To start this morning and several times throughout, I've talked about that nudge. That nudge to remember what God has done, what God is doing. And I hope for you as we go into this week that you start to recognize that nudge in your life. And maybe it's something small, but I hope that nudge starts to help all of us to focus more on Christ, to return back to what God is calling us to, to not be distracted by what's around us, but to remember what it's for, to remember what all that God has done for us is for, that God has loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus for us, and that Jesus died on the cross, forgiving us of our sins and restoring us to right relationship with God, and that because of that, because we know that good news, it is our job to share that good news with people around us. Remember what it's for. It's not so that we can make a name for ourselves, So we can say, look how great I am, look how awesome I am, look at how I'm doing everything exactly right. But rather, so that we can make the name of Jesus known. And more so than just the name of Jesus that would be known, we want the love of Jesus to be known. We want the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be known and to be shown. That is the point and that is our purpose. May we avoid those crises of confidence that keep us from sharing. May we not be afraid to share the good news of Jesus, nor may we be apathetic or distracted about the need to share the love of Jesus in a world that desperately needs it. Church, that's our job, that's our mission, that's what we are supposed to do. It's what God has called us to, and it's what God is equipping us for. So let's do it. Let's go out of these doors. Let's reflect the love of Christ. Let's show God's love to a world that desperately needs it. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you again for today. I thank you for this time together. And I thank you for your love. Lord, I just pray as we go from this place that you would give us those nudges, that you would remind us of what you have done for us. And that because of that great love that you have shown us, that we would reflect that love to those around us. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.